SMS Deflinga, nicknamed the Iron Dog due to her toughness and performance in battle. Deflinga commissioned into the High Seas Fleet in September 1914, right after the Great War kicked off. Subsequently, she participated in many actions along with the other Panzerkreuzers of the first scouting group, like the numerous raids on the English coastline, the Battle of Dogger Bank, and of course the Battle of Jutland, where she was struck at least 31 times during the battle. Like many of the other German capital ships of this period, she was scuttled in Scapa Flow in June 1919. Deflinga was an evolution for the German Navy. It saw a more efficient turret layout and an increase in the size of the main battery. I'll start out with a quote from German battlecruisers of World War I, their design, construction, and operations by Gary Staff. The final design of Deflinga was a striking ship, and with it, German shipbuilders reached a pinnacle as far as completed Panzerkreuzers, battlecruisers were concerned. This class of three ships is often regarded as the best all-around capital ships of the period and aesthetically is amongst the most handsome. The German effort for a new design for the large cruiser started in 1910. The German naval department went searching for a new design with some characteristics in mind, namely the increase in caliber of the main battery guns. Because the British had upped their guns to 13.5 inches or 343 millimeters, the Germans, in response, decided that 12 inches, or 305 millimeters, would be an appropriate response. Now, initially, some felt the increase was not necessary, namely State Secretary Admiral von Tirpitz, due to several factors, including the cost of the increase and his belief that battle ranges would not increase to 10,000 meters or more. He argued that the 11-inch or 280 millimeter guns of the previous ships were perfectly suitable for the ranges he envisaged. But after some time and some convincing, Admiral von Tirpitz was persuaded. Another major debate was the arrangement and number of turrets. Some wanted four and others five, and some wanted the turrets to be in wing positions. Eventually, they decided on four turrets along the center line of the ship. Two twin turrets forward and two aft. Other arguments continued about the armor arrangement and thickness. Those were worked out as the various design options were presented and adjusted. One more major debate in the Navy Department occurred whether the ship should have oil-fired boilers or purely coal-fired ones. People who argued for oil said it would be more efficient and would save on manpower because you would not need stokers on board. On the other hand, the people who argued for coal said that in a time of war, coal was more readily available, and Germany wouldn't have to rely on imports. The designers came to a compromise. Eight of the single coal-fired boilers would be replaced by four double-ended oil-fired ones. I know what I said earlier, but more debates about the armor scheme occurred, with some questioning the effect of detonating shells on and inside the hull. One of the Naval Department members said, One must expect that the ship will fill with water forward. Leaks will occur that cannot be sealed with the means available on board. The ship's outer hull, to which the armor is secured, will undoubtedly leak, and the forecastle ahead of the citadel will certainly fill. It cannot be kept drained with the means available on board. This comes from Gary Staff's book. Keep that quote in mind as it will be important to Deflinga and especially her sister Lutzo. By early September 1911, the design was ready. Deflinga had a normal displacement of 26,600 tons and a displacement of 31,200 tons full load. She was powered by 14 coal-fired boilers and 4 pure oil-fired boilers, providing steam for 4 turbines that drove 4 screws, giving the ship a designed 63,000 shaft horsepower. But in reality, the ship could reach 76,634 shaft horsepower, giving the ship a top speed of 26.5 knots. Her armament consisted of 8 12-inch or 305mm 50 caliber guns and twin turrets, with two forward and two aft. She also carried 12 5.9-inch or 150mm 45 caliber guns, along with 12 3.5-inch or 88mm 45 caliber guns, and four underwater torpedo tubes one stern tube, two broadside, and one bow tube. In common with other German battlecruisers, she had an extensive armor scheme, with a main belt of anywhere between 100mm to 300mm, or 3.9 inches to 11.8 inches, depending upon the part of the ship. Her deck would vary anywhere from 30mm to 80mm, or 1.2 inches to 3.1 inches thick. Her turrets had a face thickness of 270mm, or 10.6 inches thick, the sides were 225 mm or 8.9 inches thick. The rear was 260 mm or 10.2 inches thick. The sloping roof was 110 mm or 4.3 inches thick, while the horizontal roof was 80 mm or 3.1 inches thick. She was laid down in March 1912, 
launched in June 1913, and commissioned into the fleet on September 1, 1914. Der Flinge had a long period of trials, and like I mentioned before, war had been declared a month or so prior. In fact, there had even been a major naval engagement, the First Battle of Helgoland Bight, where elements of the Harwich Force led by Commodore Tirrett and Admiral Roger Keyes attacked German forces in Helgoland Bight, and with Admiral David Beatty and his battle cruisers in support, coming close to Wilhelmshaven in the High Seas Fleet. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the stir the new battlecruiser caused the British Admiralty, as they were worried about their numerical superiority for several reasons. Where Robert K. Massey in Castles of Steel, Britain, Germany, and the winning of the Great War at Sea has this to say. On August 2nd, when Jellicoe took command, the Grand Fleet had 19 dreadnought battleships and 4 dreadnought battlecruisers. 27 since then. The former Turkish battleships, now named Aaron and Agincourt, had come into the fleet. Iron Duke's sisters, Empress of India and Benbow, were coming in December. Meanwhile, the German High Seas Fleet, which had begun the war with 13 dreadnought battleships and four battlecruisers, had received, or was about to receive, three new dreadnought battleships. Each fleet had been augmented by one new battlecruiser, the British Tiger and the German Deflinge. But for Deflinge, there was training to be done, individual and group as she had to be ready to contribute to the war effort and be an effective member of Admiral Hipper's first scouting group. This was interrupted in October when she damaged her starboard low-pressure turbine, putting her out of action for a month or so. Skipping ahead a bit, after repairs, picket duty, and sorties, the next major operation was War Task 20, the bombardment of Scarborough, Whitby, and Hartlepool. Early on the morning of the 15th of December 1914, the first scouting group and the other scouting groups weighed anchor, and by the morning of the 16th, the first scouting group was closing in on the English coastline and split into two groups, with Zeidlitz, Motke, and Blücher going north to bombard Hartlepool, while Der Flinge and Van der Ten went south to Scarborough, opening fire at the Scarborough Battery and barracks at 9.02 a.m., and the fire was switched to the Grand Hotel. Fire was ceased at 9.12. In this 10-minute interval, De Flinge had expended over 300 rounds of her 15cm and 8.8cm batteries. A short time later, the northern group came south to rendezvous with De Flinge and Van der Ten to head south towards the German Bight. However, they were being followed by a British force, including the British battlecruisers. The German battlecruisers steered to avoid battle across the North Sea and passed to the east of Helgoland and route to the Jade, arriving on the 17th. The first three weeks of January 1915 were nothing special until the 24th of January with the Battle of Dogger Bank. For the sake of time and wanting to detail our role in Jutland a bit more, I'm going to gloss over the battle for the most part. If you'd like a more detailed history of the Battle of Dogger Bank, I will link to my video on HMS Lion. Admiral Franz von Hipper, commander of the German scouting groups, was to carry out an advance on the Dogger Bank, using the battlecruisers Zeidlitz, Motke, Deflinge, and the large armored cruiser Blücher. Light cruisers Rostock, Straussland, Kohlberg, and Graudenz, along with two destroyer flotillas, leaving by 5.45 p.m. on January 23rd. Through successful decoding by Room 40, the British were aware that the Germans were planning an advance. The Admiralty under Winston Churchill and Jackie Fisher decided that a joint force would be suitable to intercept the German ships, setting a rendezvous for 7 a.m. on the morning of the 24th. As the two forces came into view of one another, an ineffectual attack by the British light forces was carried out. The battle quickly became a straightforward stern chase, where Admiral Beatty hoped to destroy the German forces by long-range gunfire. At 8.52 a.m., the first ranging salvos were fired on the last ship in the German line, Blücher. Hipper had already realized the plight of his situation, messaging Admiral Friedrich von Ingenohl, the commander-in-chief of the High Seas Fleet, who would shortly be raising steam in Wilhelmshaven but it was unlikely the High Seas Fleet could reach his position before 2.30 p.m. Being outnumbered and with his top speed limited because of Blücher, it wasn't a great situation, and in consequence of this, he had previously made a dramatic turn to the south back towards Germany. The German guns, besides firing on the ineffectual attack by the light forces earlier in the battle, had remained silent, when at 9.15 they barked out in response to the British guns. De Flinge opened up with heavy artillery on the first ship from the left, Reports are muddled on the German side. I will say she most likely fired on one of the splendid cats in the battle, probably Lion and or Tiger. As the morning went on, several hits were observed on the first two ships, and fire continued until the British ships turned away later. As the British either slowed in the case of Lion, or turned to engage the crippled Blücher, the remaining German ships continued on their path home. 
Diffling had expended 234 main battery shells during this engagement. Unlike Zydlitz, who was heavily damaged in the battle, which I cover in more detail in her video, where I will link to it here, Diffling was only struck once during the engagement at 1040 in the armored belt. A second shell landed close by and caused heavy vibration at the time and subsequent leaks. To take from Captain Von Reuter's report found in Gary Staff's excellent book, Deflinga was struck once during the battle at 11.40. A 13.5-inch shell struck the armored belt 1.15 meters above the waterline to starboard at frame 181 and detonated without penetrating. Here, the belt was 300 millimeters thick. The plate was pushed in approximately 10 centimeters and was left with an indentation 30 millimeters deep and concentric rings for about 2 meters around the point of impact. The torpedo net and equipment were badly damaged, and the outer skin was bowed in below the armor. The armor carrier was bent in compartments 9 and 10. The following compartments flooded. The wing passage and protective bunkers to starboard of compartments 8, 9, and 10. Some water penetrated the boiler room, but could be removed with pumps. After arriving back in Germany, she went to the Imperial Dockyard, and it was in the floating dry dock for about a month. To be honest with you, the remainder of 1915 isn't all that exciting, and I'm not going to sit here and bore you with her operational details. Say it with me now, repairs, picket duty, and sorties. 1916 brought some more action for the ship, wherein on the 25th of March, in company with Lutzo, a message arrived that enemy destroyers had attacked picket forces in the bight. So, Deflinga weighed anchor and met with Zeidlitz and Moltke at sea. After a time, the ships began their return journey to Wilhelmshaven. The next large-scale operation began on the 24th of April, where the first scouting group left at 10.55 a.m. and made their way up the Jade with an incident involving Zeidlitz and mines, being given orders to retrace their course. With the approval of the new commander-in-chief of the High Seas Fleet, Admiral Reinhard Scheer, the operation did continue. The ships continued on their bombardment mission, where early on the 25th, shore targets were taken under fire on the English coast, along with light cruisers of the Harwich Force near Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft. Nothing much of note occurred until May 31st, 1916, when the Battle of Jutland began. At 3 a.m. on Wednesday the 31st of May, per Operational Order 6, Lutzo with Hipper on board weighed anchor and led the German scouting groups into the North Sea. Things were relatively quiet for Deflinga in the number 2 tactical position behind Lutzo, the new flagship. The first scouting group continued to push into the North Sea until 2.20 p.m. when the cruiser Elbing reported smoke from the southwest. By 3.20, the first scouting group increased speed to 25 knots to catch what turned out to be British light cruisers. Just three minutes later, British battlecruisers were spotted, these being the first and second battlecruiser squadrons under the command of Admiral David Beatty. At 3.30, after observing the British movements, Hipper understood that Beatty intended to cut him off from his home base and accordingly turned on a southeasterly course as to appear to be in full retreat back to the Jade. Now, to quote from Nick Jellicoe's Jutland the Unfinished Battle, he writes, The Germans could read Beatty's character perhaps better than Beatty realized. They knew he was a fox hunting man, they knew that he would run into the chase, and that this was their chance to lure a portion of British naval forces into the waiting guns of Sheer, heading north not far behind with the main battle fleet. Hipper ordered fire distribution from the left, ship against ship, meaning that Lutzo fired on Beatty's flagship Lion, next Deflinga on Princess Royal, Zeidlitz on Queen Mary, Moltke on Tiger, and Van der Ten fired on Indefatigable. At 3.48pm, as Beatty closed the range even further, Hipper stood on the bridge of Lutzo, calmly smoking a cigar, giving the order to open fire upon which the thunderous roar of German guns opened up the Battle of Jutland. The first few moments are described by Deflinga's gunnery officer, George Hassa, in Castles of Steel. The six ships, which had been proceeding in two columns, formed a single line ahead, like a herd of prehistoric monsters. They closed on one another with slow movements, specter-like, irresistible. At the last, there was a dull roar. The Lutzo is firing her first salvo, and immediately the signal, open fire, is hoisted. In the same second, I shout, salvos fire, and the thunder of our first salvo crashes out. Fire distribution was an issue for Beatty, as he intended for Line and Princess Royal to fire on the leading German ship Lutzo, while the other ships followed along down the line, with Queen Mary firing on Deflinga, Tiger on Zeidlitz, New Zealand on Motke, and Indefatigable on von der Tan. Lion and Princess Royal fired on Lutzo as they should have done. However, Queen Mary fired on Zeidlitz instead of Deflinga, meaning she was allowed to fire unmolested for almost 10 minutes. 
where this crack gunnery ship steamed along happily, thundering salvos as if she was in gunnery practice. Hassa further wrote, The Zeiss lenses of our periscopes were excellent. At the long distances, I could make out all the details of the enemy's ships. For instance, movements of turrets and individual guns which were lowered almost to the horizontal for loading. De Flinga was firing at Princess Royal as I mentioned, hitting her at least eight times in the first part of the battle. Truly a crack gunnery ship. By 4.15, and do note that I'm using Greenwich Mean Time for this account, Indefatigable had exploded, so Deflinga changed targets to the right, the third ship in the line, Queen Mary. From 4.23, Rapid Salvo straddled Queen Mary, and at 4.26, Queen Mary exploded and disappeared into a gigantic cloud of smoke. Hassa again writes, First of all, a vivid red flame shot up from her forepart. Then came an explosion forward, which was followed by a much heavier explosion amidships. Black debris from the ship flew into the air, and immediately afterwards, the whole ship blew up with a terrific explosion. A gigantic cloud of smoke rose. The mass collapsed inwards, and the smoke cloud hit everything and rose higher and higher. Finally, nothing but a thick, black cloud of smoke remained where the ship had been. It is disputed which ship fired the killing blow on Queen Mary, as Zeidlitz had been firing at the battlecruiser as well. Following the destruction of the two British battlecruisers, Beatty reversed course and the run to the south ended, and now the run to the north began. The first scouting group ran into the oncoming 5th Battle Squadron of Queen Elizabeth-class battleships under the command of Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas, who began engaging the oncoming ships of the first scouting group and eventually the rest of the High Seas Fleet as Shear came into view. By 5.10, De Flinga had not been hit as the British battlecruiser steered away out of effective gun range, and the battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron came into view. Once the first scouting group gave chase, De Flinga fired an HMS Valiant with high explosive shells. Only at 5.19 was she hit on the forward hull, with two further hits at 5.30 and at 5.55. A hit detached two 100mm armor plates far forward in the bows, leading to some flooding. By this point, the run to the north was coming to a close, and at around 5.55, Beatty's battlecruisers came into the view of the commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet, Admiral Jellicoe. Deflinga was coming under increasingly heavy fire from the British 1st and 2nd battlecruiser squadrons, and soon enough the 3rd battlecruiser squadron to the northeast. Still, because of poor visibility, Deflinga was unable to respond. As visibility cleared, cruisers and destroyers were spotted just after 6, causing the 1st scouting group to turn south, and then southwest. From 6.10, the 1st scouting group turned to starboard back on a northeasterly course, and an enemy cruiser was immediately spotted and taken under fire from Lutzo, this being HMS Defense. There was some confusion aboard Der Flinge as to the ship's identity, which delayed opening fire. Der Flinge did not hesitate to open fire on the battlecruisers of the 3rd Squadron, taking them under fire from 625 onwards. She fired on Admiral Horace Hood's flagship, HMS Invincible. Der Flinge came under effective fire from the squadron. She was firing on Invincible when at 6.31 she exploded. Lutza was also firing on the battlecruiser, and in my video on her, I gave a first-hand account of an officer on the bridge of Lutzo during this time, where he writes, Meanwhile, we had turned onto a southerly course, and suddenly an English battlecruiser of the Invincible type appeared out of the haze, clearly and relatively near, four points to port astern. I can't say strongly enough what satisfaction I felt to finally have this pest presented before my eyes and as quick as lightning, the commands were given out. But already, a dark object slides between my periscope and the opponent. The corner of the Admiral's Bridge, which limits the angle of my vision of my periscope object lens to about 10 degrees. Has the aft position measured? Yavul, 100 hectometers. Direction aft position. Capitan Leutnant Bode gives brief and clear orders, and to the inexpressible joy of the whole ship, 15 seconds later, our guns crash out again, with the exception of B turret. I heard everything myself through the headphones, what Bode and the artillery transmitting station said, and now also saw the opponent again. Over, four down, salvo, straddle, salvo. As the sound of the fall of the shot indicator screeched, the columns flickered out of the water around the enemy, and again the beautiful and unmistakable red flares up. Invincible was hit on the Q turret, and the shell detonated in the turret, blowing off the roof, and a great explosion followed as the magazine detonated. The ship broke in two and sank. At 6.35, the first scouting group altered course west to extricate itself from the effective fire of the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, and at 6.38, Deflinger ceased fire. 
At 6.55, the first scouting group began to turn to starboard, and while turning, Defling was hit again at 7.04. Lutzow had been forced out of action due to her damage, and Admiral Hipper had left the flagship. Meanwhile, Captain Hartog of Deflinga was in command of the first scouting group. At a little past seven as the two sides dueled, Deflinga and the other battlecruisers were ordered against the oncoming Grand Fleet, being given the order, Battlecruisers, at the enemy. Give it everything. Massey says, The charge of the German battlecruisers has come to be called a death ride. Although Lutzow was out of action and the other four German battlecruisers were heavily damaged, Deflinga's Captain Hartog led the squadron at 20 knots towards the British line. Two of the ships were scarcely more than battered hulls. Filled with thousands of tons of salt water, the sea rolling over their bows up the forward turrets, more than half their guns destroyed or out of action. Their compartments filled with dead and dying men. Yet, they drove forward. Nevertheless, during this critical time, Deflinga, as the leading ship, came under effective fire and was hit a total of 14 times. You can see why she's called an iron dog now. C and D turrets were disabled, A turret was hit, and the conning tower and bridge were hit. Hits on the armor belt, deck, and through the funnels also happened, with Hassa writing about some of these at 722. Suddenly, we seem to hear the crack of doom. A terrific roar, a tremendous explosion, and then darkness, in which we felt a colossal blow. The whole conning tower seemed to be hurtled into the air as though by the hands of some menacing giant and then shook itself into its former position. A heavy shell had struck the foreman about 50 centimeters in front of me. The shell exploded but failed to pierce the thick armor. The terrific blow had burst open the heavy armored door, which now stood wide open. Two men strove in vain to force it back, but it was jammed too tight. Once more, we heard the colossal roar and crash. With the noise of a bursting thunderbolt, a 38 centimeter shell exploded under the bridge. An extraordinary thing happened. The terrific concussion of the bursting shell shut the armored door of the fore control. The first scouting group was unable to effectively reply during this time because of smoke obscuring their range, and in consequence of this, visibility was poor. They eventually steered on a west-southwest course, and at 7.50, they turned onto a southerly course abeam the high seas fleet. At 8.20, action resumed with the British battlecruisers, where Deflinga suffered her final damage when A turret was struck again at 8.28. Deflinga, in her injured state, was steering towards Horn's Reef as she could not keep up with Moltke, the battlecruiser Hipper had boarded and made his flagship. With Gary Staff saying about the remainder of her night, Deflinga and Fontartan were unable to keep up, and positioned themselves at the rear of the battle line on the orders of Vice Admiral Scheer. The only event of the night occurred at 3.40, when the ship ahead, von der Ten, had to maneuver abruptly to avoid a torpedo. During the remainder of the night, Deflinga followed the line south. At 3.40 on June 1, 1916, she anchored in Wilhelmshaven Roads. I didn't describe every single hit Deflinga took during the battle. However, she did suffer upwards of 31 hits during the battle. Nine men on Deflinga were awarded the Iron Cross First Class, including Hassa. In early June, the battered Deflinga moved to Kiel for repairs, which were not complete until October. The remainder of the war had followed along the same lines as many of the other Panzerkreuzes we have discussed. Say it with me now, repairs, picket duty, and sorties. One last attempt occurred on the 30th of October 1918, where she ran out into Schilling Roads ready for an impending operation, where Deflinga and her new sister Hindenburg and the other ships of the High Seas Fleet were to fight one last battle. This was to be the death ride of the High Seas Fleet. The operation was meant to lure out the Grand Fleet from Scapa Flow and use all available means at the disposal of the High Seas Fleet to destroy the Grand Fleet. Admiral Reinhard Scheer, who led the German fleet at Jutland, now promoted, approved Hipper's plan as both admirals hoped that, in addition to salvaging the honor of the German Navy, a tactical success might reverse the military position and avert surrender. This was not to be, as the admirals had not taken into consideration the war weariness and defeatism of their sailors, who did not necessarily want to die in an all-out battle that most likely would not have changed the outcome of the war. In the ensuing mutiny, Hipper had to call off the operation, and by this point, the armistice was less than two weeks away. On November 19th, Deflinga was part of the group of interred ships that was transferred to Britain under the command of Vice Admiral Reuter. On June 21, 1919, the large cruiser was sunk by her crew in Scapa Flow. She was later salvaged and scrapped by the British in 1938, being the last German capital ship to be raised. I'll leave you with a quote from Gary Staff we started with. 
The final design of Deflinger was a striking ship, and with it, German shipbuilders reached a pinnacle as far as completed Panzerkreuzer's battlecruisers were concerned. This class of three ships is often regarded as the best all-around capital ship of the period, and aesthetically is amongst the most handsome. Thank you all for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe, as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, have a great week.